Uh, so I'm going to talk about threat modeling and cloud applications, but really uh, this is more about the cloud application side than the threat modeling side. Uh, there'll be a, there's a talk tomorrow, I think it's exactly the same time, it's 11.40. Uh, my colleague Mike Ware is going to talk more about the threat modeling process. Here I've got the threat modeling pieces kind of built into um, how we look at cloud. Uh, you know, one of the things about, I mean, so this, this talk is called cloud threat modeling uh, because our marketing guides wanted us to use the word cloud. Uh, it's, it, I mean, it's a typical marketing thing, you know? So you have, you have something, it's sort of almost related to it, as long as they can find that little bit of thing, you know? It's like, let's tie it to cloud because that's the hot thing. Um, it really, it's more about AWS. Um, I've been looking at cloud for about a year and a half, two years, something like that. Um, and I've been a little disappointed in how cloud gets treated as this one sort of thing. You know, it's, there's cloud, and then there's, but as we've been looking at it, it turns out that there are many different flavors of clouds, and there's all sorts of different ways of looking at it. And in terms of getting down to a set of specific things that as someone in AppSec that you can actually work on, um, I think you have to get below that, right? And you have to start looking at the specifics of the, what type of cloud you're looking at and then all the way down to the specifics of the platform. So this talk really is about that level of, you know, trying to move this conversation from the FUD level of, oh my God, you know, cloud is the boogeyman, you know, security boogeyman of this millennium to, all right, well, how actually can we improve the security of applications that use cloud uh, because it's going, you know, the cloud applications are going to be there. We have no choice. We just have to make them as secure as they can be. And from there, we can do risk assessments to figure out then, you know, what are the, the, what are the risks. Um, so one of the things that I find very useful is this, uh, is this the NIST cloud framework. Um, there are three big pools, and I apologize for this diagram because I just took a, it's just a, yeah, I don't know, it's the JPEG from their site. Um, but the three big blobs are essential characteristics, um, the, ser the service models, and then the deployment models. Now, from, a, from an architectural standpoint, um, this is all you need to know about cloud uh, in order to do your threat modeling. Um, when I use architecture, it's also, it's, it's like really it's a set of patterns. And so from, from the essential characteristics, so here it's like, on-demand self-service, measured service. You know, these things help you differentiate an application that you have today from when that application moves to the cloud. So just like our marketing people like to you know, associate everything with cloud that has at least tangentially related, I think what's gonna happen is that you're gonna see vendor products doing it as well as internal projects. I mean, how many of you guys have projects that are cloud related in your organization? Okay, so how many of those are small funded projects? See, one, oh, okay. So you're not supposed to raise your hand. Okay, because the point is, is that if there's a big funded project, what happens? Everybody and his brother wants to get their pet, little pet project associated with it because that's where the money is, right? So you, as a security guy, you're gonna be going like, well, what, is this rewrite of this application, is that really cloud? So essential characteristics help you understand that. Okay, um, the service models, so they're uh, software as a service, platform as a service, and infrastructure as a service. And it's really from left to right, wait, yeah. From left to right, um, you're going from, you've got the whole application down to infrastructure services where you're buying computes, okay, resources. Now, if you're buying the whole application, I assume you guys are all AppSec guys, right? I mean, this is a WASP, AppSec, yeah? All right, our job is done, right? We gotta turn it over to the lawyers because all of the controls that are gonna go in place for a software as a service application, I mean, it's, you know, unless you're a lawyer, right? Those are gonna be all in the SLAs. Like, mom wanted me to be a lawyer, I ended up an engineer, so she was pretty disappointed, but she's psyched now that this whole thing is coming in place because now I gotta learn all this stuff about contracts and SLAs, you know, she's, got, she's waiting for me to, you know, to apply to law school. Okay. Um, 
At the other end is infrastructure as a service, where you're buying computes. All right, now we're starting to get, starting to get interesting for us as AppStack guys. And that platform as a service, again, you know, you're talking about the development environment plus the build environment. You know, that's for me what platform as a service is. It's like you think you've got the raw computes, you know, AWS. Think AWS as, as the I as the infrastructure as a service. Platform as a service is like Azure. Plus, there's all these platforms as a service where it's like you've got all the build environments. They all are part of that, right? So, the service uh, the service model tells you, you know, how much you have to worry about, right? Now, the deployment model is at the bottom. Public, you've heard people talk about people talk that about people talk about public, private, hybrid, community. Ignore community because I don't. I mean, I haven't seen any of those out there. Um, when you see one, then you'll you can worry about it. But for pretty much, they tell you who are your who are your threats. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm not supposed to use that word because um, Sigital has this weird like there's okay. So we're in the middle of Lutheranism right here. I mean, in, here in beautiful Minneapolis, you know, I'm from the East Coast. Okay, so it's all Anglican out there, right? And I'm not going to get about down to arguing religion with you guys. So I'm not going to argue about whether a threat is the person or a threat is the you know, the, the thing that happens that's bad, all right. It's just not a useful debate, okay, and I'm going to lose, all right. But, so, I don't know, how many of you guys know, like, the, the der derivation of a the term Ajax for, like, uh, and it's not the cleaner, I'm talking about the technology stuff, right. It used to be capital A, capital J, capital A, capital X, right. It was asynchronous JavaScript, what? Oh, and XML, okay, so, in current, I can't even remember what it is, because now it's just like AJAX. So it's, how many AJAX implementations still use XML? Small number, right? Backend stuff is all going rusty. Yeah? And how much of it's using JavaScript? Flash applications? I mean, they're different, they're, you know, they're different sort of client-side language options. So the, you know, it went from this truly an acronym to just a word. So for me, the threat modeling thing is just a word, okay? We're not gonna talk about, I'll try to use the word attackers. Um, I don't know about Mike, you know, Mike may get into the religious debate um, and, uh, you know, he's free to do so. Um, uh, but uh, approach with peril, my friend. Um, in any case, everything you need to know about cloud threat modeling is on that slide, okay? Why? Because from an architectural standpoint, and this is one of the things that I think is pretty interesting about some of the work we're doing at Sigital, is we think about architecture as this, as this abstraction of designs, where you can identify a set of components and relationship of components, and some of the side effects and the vulnerabilities and the inherent flaws in those sets of components. Like, for us, OWASP, really the open, you know, the web, web applications are one of those architectures, end tier, thin client with a browser. You can see the OWASP top, I don't know, the top 10, but all of the vulnerabilities are associated with those architectures. So when we look at larger systems where that system, where an application plays, is one application in a series of cooperating applications, we can see, oh, this is an end tier, thin client. OWASP top 10 and all of those associated vulnerabilities get associated there. Um, oh, this piece over here, that's a thick client with a, you know, a, an embedded you know, kernel, da 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 da. That's a different set of vulnerabilities. Right? So you, we think of these things as architectures, and the architecture brings both you know, a set of you know, power, it brings a set of security controls, it also brings a set of baggage. Right? And the baggage are the vulnerabilities and the flaws, right? So by looking at, the, at your cloud, dissecting it into these, you know, taking a look at it from this perspective, you can start using that to figure out, well, what's the baggage that's going to be, that's going to come with this application as we move it to the cloud? Um, any questions? You guys are really quiet. Are you always this quiet? Where's the, I, I, didn't, I, mean, I kind of... I don't, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no fair. Okay, so he's ex digital. We, we booted him out, okay, because he was such a. Yeah, yeah. But anyway, 
Um, yeah, I, like I said, I, I'm trying to stay away from that whole thing. Like, don't ask me what God is or anything like that. I don't talk about those. Um, okay, so, so for us, cloud, the PaaS and the IAS are the most interesting. They are subtly different. When you start seeing applications that are built on a cloud architecture, I mean, think about it as like saying, oh, let's think of an application that's built on Windows versus one that's built on Linux versus something that's built on a mainframe. You know, those are fundamentally, well, fundamentally different architectures. Um, there, there are subtle things that are different because the security controls are different. Um, and we think that this, this notion of threat modeling, looking at it at this level of, at the design level of a set, as a set of components, is very useful and is a first order of understanding of what the problems are and a very useful way of understanding the risks because they're at a high enough level that you can associate them back to actual risks. Um, so I'm going to kind of go through the threat modeling basic stuff because I know Mike is going to do a much better job of it tomorrow. Um, but in, a, in short, for us, a threat model is um, there is still some debate around it's digital, even to this day. So he may say something different, and that's your carte blanche, Mike, to, to like completely contradict me. So um, anyone who's listening today you should find some things that where, where I contradict him and pin him to the wall tomorrow because I'll be interested in hearing what, what he has to say. Um, anyway, so it's basically you take a system, you look at how it's put together, you figure out the assets, the things that we're trying to protect, it's data or function, and then the security controls that are protecting those assets. That's what you start with. From there, you juxtapose that view of the system with the doomsday scenarios, the things that could go wrong from business side, and a list of potential attackers. You're looking at these two things. Okay? And from there, you can kind of figure out instead of like, what the hell can go wrong? Uh, this is Mike's slide. I'll let him discuss that tomorrow. Um, and then that's just a picture. Just, you know. I don't know. The marketing guys, it's like, you've got to have pictures. Uh, so there is a process. Um, so we talked about this diagramming the system structure. That's the first one. Identify the assets and controls, right? That's the first part. Right? It's the, here's the juxtaposition, you know, here's the enumerate doomsday scenarios and identify attackers. This, is, this little space in here is to juxtapose the two. Um, and then from that, you're gonna, what will drop out of that is actually there's a set of misuse cases and abuse cases that are going to fall out of that. Right? Um, then there's integrate, you know, iterate probably is up here because you're probably going to iterate to, well, yeah, three through five, three and four mostly, but you tend, do tend to, as you, go through this and start digging into it, you start going, oh, I forgot about that thing. You know, you forgot, oh, I forgot about this little piece of data over here. Or, you know, so you do iterate and you, you go forward. Um, so any questions about threat modeling? I know that was a very quick thing and Mike's gonna spend a lot more time on it tomorrow. Cool. All right, so looking at cloud, at AWS applications, um, we've been looking at a bunch. Um, and the application I'm going to, sh where this little sort of use case is one that's a generalization of several different applications across a s different set of industries that we've looked at. Um, remember, we're looking for patterns because as a consulting firm, you know, our job is to go in there and get it done quickly. So we're looking for ways of making this run faster. And so we, that's why we look for patterns. Um, so this is a hybrid infrastructure as a service threat model. So the deployment model is um, hybrid. So that's mixed uh, uh, data center and cloud and infrastructure as a service. Okay. So here's our use case. Uh, S3 storage is very, is very, a very, it's a big hunk of block storage. And who's using AWS here? Do we have any AWS access? Oh, okay, excellent. So you guys are, oh, that's right, Will actually works for them. Hmm. All right. <clears throat> yeah, he's got the to That's true. He's got his tomatoes wound up. See, he, he wanted to be shortstop instead of playing in left field where Mike is, so he has a better throw, you know, home plate. Right. Okay, um, so S3, it, it's a great, I'm from Boston, right? So we're like Red Sox nation, you know, we're totally into it. Um, 
S3 is you know, large chunks of block storage, very cheap, well, relatively cheap, right? Um, and so what we're seeing is that this use of S3 is very interesting from a business standpoint because especially where there are large chunks of data. So you can see you know, that medical images might be a large chunk of data. Um, we see you know, large media files. Um, we see it in terms of you know, you know, game systems where there are large things, you know, basically large chunks of, of you know, you know, either their images, actually it's really in the game system, it's you know, a mixture of images and content that, needs to get, that wants to get downloaded onto the client. Right. Um, for the medical images things, you know, I think that disaster recovery becomes a very interesting case for S3 because um, in, in disaster recovery, if I have large quantities of data, I have to have a DR site that has that same, all that same data. It means I have to replicate the data over there. I have to buy all the storage. Right? Now, when, who here buys storage? Anyone buy storage? No. Okay. Hmm. All right. So do you think I buy, like if I'm buying like 100 terabytes of storage, Let's say I have, that's what I actually have to store. That means I have to have another 100 terabytes over in my DR site, okay? Now, do you think I buy, you know, another terabyte at a time? No, I'm, I'm, I'm dealing with whomever my storage vendor is, and I'm buying large chunks of it. So I'm buying two chunks, and I'm buying two chunks, right? So the idea is if I can buy, if I can only buy one chunk using S3, then I can, I can really reduce my overall capital outlay. I can turn some of my CapEx into OpEx. And that's, you know, at the CIO level, that's, that's the equation that's going on in their minds. Okay. So here's our primary, here's our DR site, right? So I don't have to pay for unused capacity. Okay, that's, that's what they're thinking. Well, whether that's a fallacy or not, that'll be my next year's talk. Okay. But, um, you know, just, just think about like how outsourcing went, okay, right? Or, <clears throat> okay, so the idea then becomes, okay, well, it's not, let's not do this DR thing. Let's use S3 and let's put everything in S3 in the cloud. Let's put it in the cloud, right? Um, and then we don't, have to, we don't have to replicate it. Now, even if you buy, okay, so even if you put it in the cloud, the cloud is not this magical place. It is, does not provide, it provides a some level of, okay, I think Amazon especially, it provides like some large number of nines of, of um, dur durability. But it doesn't provide availability in those same, in that, with that same level of nines. I think it's three nines maybe, okay? And if you were like doing cloud stuff, I think it was last, was it this spring maybe? I can't remember when when, AB, when that data center went down, right? Pardon? April twenty-first. April twenty-first. April Yeah, see, it seems like so long ago. I mean, it was like, but anyway, but yeah. I mean, so it went down. Now, if you look at the people that bought a single availability zone, they were only in that data center. Those guys were hosed, right? But if you look at the people that bought the multi-availability zone feature. Only 2.5 of those applications of those customers were hosed by the data, that data center going down. So you have to have. I mean, you still have to do something. There's no free lunch. Okay. So again, you got to know your controls here. So for a DR, make sure you have multiple multiple availability zones. Okay. So now you're starting to see that the like this again. My point is that you've got to understand the platform. What does it give you? What does it not provide you? Because it's all the same. There's no difference between programming and building systems in the cloud than building it in your own data center. It's just that they're doing stuff, some stuff for you. No magic, but know what you're, getting, know what you're buying. Okay. Now, from a, that's kind of an infrastructural view of it. But the, for, for me, the more interesting view is like from an application standpoint, what does this thing look like? So I go from a, I'm going to go from a very simple, I'm going to assume this is a very simple web app, just for argument's sake. Um, it, they aren't, but they, but it's good, good enough to know for this because when you start looking at, at this new app, I mean, we're talking about 
you know, fundamentally something different. We don't have this DR thing to worry about. We have to worry about this component here actually has very different characteristics than this character, than this data, data store over here. The, the DR components over here, where the storage lives, that's a high availability kind of application, right? We've now switched, we've now switched application types because we don't have this ability to go to DR. I mean, we know that it's going to shift, but, there, but we, have high, we have different availability constraints and requirements. So now know that you have this whole new app. So now we're going to diagram the system structure. Um, this is a very simple, sim simplified view of our, of our original app. Um, you can see here that from a, from a threat modeling standpoint, we've done, we've done some trust zoning. Sort of a, that's kind of a, you know, that's, that's a, you know, different, the app server, the host, we've done some threat, you know, here are our malicious network attacker, our malicious client, um, the security controls we have here, we have, an, you know, auth and auth through SiteMinder, we have the file system here. So, we, you know, part of the threat modeling process is to go through, you know, if you went back and you were to read slides, it says, oh, go through, identify the assets and the controls. Again, this is when you see a, a the reason this, I did this all in one little slide rather than derive this is because we had an end-tier web app, right? These are the canonical things that fall into place. You see, if you say I have an end-tier web app, you know you've got the app server, the host, really, you know, some database on the back end. All of this kind of comes in. That's part of the baggage. So, right? All right, so what does this do to our threat model? So we start there. So now we have this whole other thing, right? So we have, we have the AWS piece up here. Um, we have our storage. This is the S3 thing. This is everything that we were trying to do is move all that stuff from the file system out into S3. But you know what? It's not quite that simple, right? We're going to have, there's got to be this little database here that's keeping track of all the stuff that's up here. We have to have, you know, this little application that, actually, that, that you know, makes these buckets available during the DR because DR is not a like that for an application like this, right? DR, you're shifting over, you're moving all, like, you know, you're moving DNS entries. You know, it's, it's inherently a slow process. Now, if these are medical images, do you really want your doctor to go, oh my gosh, we have to wait for your image, you know, in the OR, you know? No, you want it to be, you want, the guy wants the image, okay? You want him to have the image, okay? So you have to build all of this other stuff, right, in Amazon to make that stuff available during the DR process. So now we've got more stuff to worry about. And so the new system, this, this system is going to affect the, 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 you know, AWS is going to affect the whole front model. Um, so we have the thing, um, I can't remember what we call this thing. Um, it's like the threat traceability matrix. Yes? yes. Awesome, okay. Um, it's just the, I, I have a little. I, well, I, I don't have little kids anymore. But when they were little, they used to come back, and there was this who, what, when, where, how. I mean, they, they went to this phase. If you have kids, it must be around six or sixth grade, maybe. They go through it. So it's who, what, when, where, how, right, why. I mean, they, you're, you know, it's like writing. You know, it's, it's writing about. You know, it's books. It's the English stuff. Um, and that's what the threat traceability matrix is. So you're going to fill this thing. It's basically you're going to fill in this sparse matrix, and you're going to fill it in as you go along in the threat modeling process. And um, there are things you know at different times. And so that in the background, that's what's driving all this. Is we're trying to fill this matrix in. Okay. So you can see up here too that with our external, you know, we don't know who, but mostly they're external. But we know the how. Because we have a web app, we're going to have all of these things, right? We have all the OWASP ones that goes right into the right into the matrix, um, and then we know because this is a public cloud. Remember, you know that was the the deployment model. We know that we have um, we have multi you know it's a multi tenant architecture, so we have those hows to worry about, right? Again, so that's why the as like I said baggage, you know, you, once you start having these architecture these architectures and you start seeing your systems as groupings of architectures you can start filling in the matrix in big chunks okay so what are where are the where are the assets we know we have our, our the, the assets before but here are the assets we've got the s3 buckets which are have our data we have this EBS volume now which 
It's a, it's a little, little relational database that's keeping track of all these, the S3 buckets. Um, we have this additional set of entry points here that's says secure, right? This could be a web application too, but we have all these things to worry about. Now, those are the, those are the assets. What are the controls? See, now below we had you know, our enterprise identity and access management guide. So I might just use SiteMinder because I couldn't think of what the other ones were. But that's not going to work necessarily here, over here. Right? So we're missing this piece here. Um, instead of having network zones here, Amazon has these things called security groups. Um, so they're like firewalls, but they're a little different. You know, they, they're actually a little bit more interesting than firewall rules. Um, and we still have our traditional, we have our security groups. They, all, they have to be applied to each instance, and we have to worry about, we still have the, data, the you know, standard database RBAC over here. So again, yeah. So security groups, it's like a firewall rule, except it's actually, it's really, you actually create roles. There are groups of rules that say, that are named, and when you launch an instance, you actually say, this, secure, this instance has these security groups associated with it, which makes it very powerful because you can now, you can create sets of rules and launch instances with those different sets of rules. Right? So it's diff a little different, but they look, they just look like firewall rules. Um, so those are cool. So you need, you need to know you have to do that for all of your machines. Now, um, the problem with security groups is because especially if, as you go through development, you add machines, you're not quite sure. These, you know, how many lines do you think, if you actually do a EC2 describe you know, security groups, how many think lines do you think you have in one of these files? 25, 50, you know, like 200, right? So management, so like firewall rules, management of them as your application be, gets, 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 gets hairy. It's also, you've got all of the old security group roles and stuff, all the experimental ones in there. So you gotta make sure you get rid of those, okay? So management of security groups, you could probably use your, whatever tools you're using to manage firewall rules with. Um, integration with enterprise auth. Um, okay, so I think we, the, the previous speaker talked about this a little bit, but your choices are, I can make my LDAP available to the cloud, which is a good or a bad idea. It's a pretty rotten idea, okay? Just, I mean, so what are you gonna do, okay? I mean, people do do it. They, so they, they, you know, I mean, we've, like I said, we've seen some of these things. They make the LDAP available, bad. They cop, you know, they make copies of all the users. They rip, bad idea, okay, all right? So I'm not going to get into that whole set of bad ideas thing here, but for this app, so for this we're going to say we're going to use SAML. Okay, just wave our hands and make this problem go away because that's an, again that's a whole nother talk. Okay, um, so we're going to use SAML, um, and thank God there's support for it in AWS. Okay, and they have there there's some other features in AWS that we're going to take advantage of as well. All right, but that's really but remember that SAML that's for your auth here. Okay. That's for the SSO here, not and for the Identity Federation here, not necessarily. There's a whole bunch of other identities that get, are going to come into play. Okay. So now here we have this thing. Now, the nice thing, of, I think if you go back to essential characteristics, there was a one thing called on-demand billing, right? You actually have to pay for this thing, right? Unlike CapEx, where you pay for it once and you just get to use it, you've got to pay for this by the drink. So you've got this site running up here, which is used during the DR process. Well, that thing's up and running. You know, the cash register's going ka ching, ka ching, ka ching, ka ching. So your CFO is going to say what? Shut it down, right? When you don't need it. Okay. So how do you? So okay, fine. So you shut it down. Now what problem has this created? Okay. So normally, when you launch an instance. You have to have a set of credentials to launch the instance, you know, on all that good stuff, right? And so, but now you need it to be automated, right? So now you have to put this EC2 key pair down here somewhere in your infrastructure. You've got to have to ho have a host that launches it, right? So now you have these credentials that you have, these EC2 credentials that you have to s secure. 
EC2 credentials, there are, let me just make sure I know where I am. Okay, yeah. Um, so, you know, so they're, and they're required to, so you need to, you know, you need AWS credentials to access anything in, in, in AWS. So you still have, you have that problem all over the place. Um, one thing I want to say about the credentials, though, and you can read here, this is a slide, this is kind of taken from the AWS thing. There's like lots of different credentials, plus there's this whole IAM thing. Um, the bottom line, though, is, um, or sort of, not the bottom line, but kind of the, the thing that is at the bottom of the slide is who pays for AWS in your organization? Going back to our essential characteristics, it's on-demand, there's this thing called on-demand self-service. And what does that really mean? What is the, you know, some architect wrote that, but what does that really mean? You pay for what you use. You pay for what you use. Actually, that's, that's the payability, that's the, that's the billability thing. Exactly. So what, ha what do you think happens in your organization? Random people spin up stuff. Exactly. Random people spin up stuff. So being able to control those credentials, right, is something, so not only do you have to worry about it from a secure, you know, sort of traditional software security view of I got to protect this credential material. There's also this problem now of what, what are the credentials that we're going to allow in the organization? Who's going to have access to them that can spin up these, in, these instances for these particular things? So having, going back to that little picture of saying that there's a host there that's actually doing that, that actually might be a good thing because that might be your, your show point to be able to say, this place has those credentials. You can actually do credential mapping from your internal, you know, your internal identify, you know, sort of internal identification ID system saying, you know, Joe can spin up these, these images, this other thing can spin up these other images, keeping those AWS credentials that actually have the, bill, the, the billing associated with it, keeping those secure. So that actually might be a, a way of componentizing that or in isolating that. So you've got that problem to solve when you have AWS in, in the mix. Um, okay. So S3 and S, uh, sorry, S3 buckets and ACLs. So buckets have objects, and those things have either ACLs or policies associated with them. Um, when, you make an, when you make an access to the bucket, AWS identifies you based on your AWS credential, right? and the ACL will give you access to it, or the policy says this person has access to it. And you can see here, as long as we're going from, you know, from our app server down here, making this, this call to get the bucket data, the bucket data comes back here and goes back to the client, right? So this dude is going to have the S3 username and account to get to the bucket. That's why there's a little star. That's that. That's the, the that's the credential that we're going to have to protect. You can see here from our threat model, there's actually no protection on it right now, which is typical, right? Username and passwords in the clear, being stored, you know. Right? Um, so. You know, so you ha you know, so you have this. You have this is the control that's here, at the at the bucket. Now, because you're paying for all this, if I'm bringing the data back through here, back to the, my user over here, I'm paying for bandwidth over here, right? I, I do have bandwidth over here that I'm paying for, but I, that's a fixed cost. But here, I'm paying for bandwidth here, and I'm paying for that on my EC2 bill. Right? So the CFO is going to go say, we need to stop that. And we're a plus, we're, you know, these are like, if these are video things, you know, you don't want to, you definitely don't want to keep sucking them back through all your infrastructure, paying for it twice, actually. So what you're going to do is you're going to actually do this. Or maybe you guys aren't, but your developers are going to want to do that. Right? They're going to want to say, the client itself wants to be able to make a call directly to S3 and suck that data back. You want to bring it right back without going through your infrastructure. So, how do you do that, right? Are you going to put the S, your S3 credentials on the client? Oh, sorry. Yeah? Well, fortunately, most of the applications we've seen have not gone there. They, the developers have realized that was a stupid idea. Okay? <laughs> That's a good idea. That's a good thing. But what did they do instead? Exactly. Full read access to everything in, the, in here, because there's no Apple. 
So it turns out that now, now, so now they're going to, they're coming, you're, you're, you're assessing this thing, and you go, okay, well, they're going to look at you when you say, well, you've you got to have an apple there, and they're going to say, well, what should I do? Well, the idea, I mean, the nice thing is that AWS has a couple methods for doing this. One are, if you have apples turned on, there's this thing called query string authentication, where you actually can get a timed-based URL. If you're using the IM features of, of, um, of AWS, you can also use this thing called get federation token. I think that's the, your, I think that's the, that's the API call. Um, again, it's a time-based token, which this guy gets, gives it to the, the client, and the client can use it, and it's time-based. So rather than creating some of your own lame brain scheme to do it, you know, you got to understand, if you know what the platform gives you, you know, your guidance to the developer is so much better. So it, it's really well worth going through and spending the couple days reading through all of the friggin' AWS docs, building your little applications. You know, it really is worth it. I mean, your manager won't think so, but believe me, it will be. Um, so, enumerate the doomsday scenarios. Um, the other thing, so the other thing I always hated about the, the typical cloud security doomsday, you know, talk is, um, at, last, at least last year, it's not so bad this year, but last year it was every possible security risk was associated with the cloud. I mean, and, you know, so there's, and it's really not. I mean, yes, those things do exist, but really what you want to start thinking about is what's unique to the cloud. Um, so I started my list of things that are, I think, are kind of reprioritized. I think data, so Malicious Insider, we'll talk about that one in just a second. Um, data in transit, certainly on AWS, you've got to have to worry about, you know, there's no network, there's no secure network thing. So you have to worry about that. Um, management interface compromise. Um, how many of your applications, I mean, how many of you guys are enterprise developers or security people? Most enterprise? So when you build, an, when someone builds an application, do they build a management interface to it? They do? Oh, that's cool. That's actually good. Usually it's like some command line thing, right? It's usually, he's laughing behind you. So he knows, he, he's like. Well, they have both. Yeah. Yeah, but I'm talking about, you know, write this little Java program and, you know, it's, it's all hacked together. But, so, you know, so they've got this, these little programs. Now, do, what from a, an evaluation standpoint, do you evaluate the management interfaces and look at them from, you know, from, like, what the threat model is for those? It's part of the app. It's part of the app. Okay, so now where in a cloud-based application is that, is that management interface? Is it inside the secure part of the data center? Oh, you're not saying touchdown. You're saying 10 minutes. Okay. okay. I, I'm serious. Like, you, it took me it was just a second. I was like, okay. Um, so now, you, so your management interfaces now are going to be all out in AWS. They're out, I mean, basically that's the story, right? Um, infrastructure supply chain stability. So we've been talking about a lot about AWS, and it's like you guys are consuming AWS, but if you consume a pass, a lot of these passes, like PHP, fog, you know, all these things, these, you know, what do you think those are? What do you think they're built on? You're buying them, they're built on AWS, right? It's gonna be a, you know, pretty soon it's gonna be someone else is built on this, this pass that's built on AWS. That's the supply chain I'm talking about, right? Do you have, do you have to worry about that? Um, and then, you know, the, the typical, this is a, you know, the multi-tenancy part, direct attack, direct denial of service, or really some, against someone else, another tenant, right? So, uh, but the unique to cloud is the termination of the provider, yep. Um, it's these e-discovery things, I think you were talking about the previous thing we talked about. What statements does Amazon make publicly about That, I don't know. Will, what, what, what statements does I'm Amazon make about... I'm not here to speak, but... <laughs> yeah. Actually, I don't know. That I don't know. Um, 
uh, and then and then changes in and then you know again the jurisdictional changes the e subpoena of multi tenancy those are the things that are unique to the cloud. Right. Um, so identify the attackers. So we have all our canonical attackers. Um, there is so there's additional you know there is additional attackers here. Um, there's you know that it changes where they are, and then from a a diagramming standpoint, it's always good to have this multi-tenant thing here. So, you know, part of us, part of this thing is diagramming. It's always good to know where your multi-tenancy is. Um, now, really, the question I have is: Is the AWS admin someone I have to worry about? So, all I mean, for the enterprise side of it, everyone's going, "Yeah, we have to worry about this." All right. So, I'm going to give the counter argument, and you guys can decide for yourself. So the other, the, other, the, other, the other side of it is that if I'm AWS or I'm Google or something like that, I have to have these admins. I have to train them. I have to manage them. I mean, part of what you're paying for is me to do that for you. So if there is, if I have a malicious admin who does something wrong to my business, who stands to lose more? You, the customer, or me, the provider? Probably you. Yeah, because it's actually, because the, the admin would touch more clients, more potential clients. But, but it, just one. Right. But if but but if if there's a provider, their argument, the other side of it is if the you know, if there's a compromise of all these clients, won't Amazon get sued by all those clients? Won't they won't their business I mean, you know, what's the what about the, the continuation of their business? Right? So they I mean so I know that, I guess the, the, the point is, is, is the thought exercise of your business, your data versus them. I mean, that's really what it comes down to. So it's not the FUD of, oh my God, I don't control that admin. It's what am I putting there? Who's going to lose more, him or me? Right? Because it comes down to, that, that's a risk management decision. Now you're starting to think about it in, that, in, those, in those things. It's not just the knee-jerk reaction of, oh my God, I got to worry about the malicious insider. Your malicious insiders may just be just as bad, right? As and perhaps worse. And so, it's You're saying that their logging and monitoring of their insiders are better than my logging and monitoring of my insiders. Maybe that's that's their. I'm saying that's their argument. And I think it has to do with size, size of your organization. If you're, I don't know how. I forgot to do the poll. I usually do a poll like who is in a large organization, who is in a small organization. But if you're a small startup, I mean, certain, certainly, who cares, right? If you are United Healthcare Group, you care. You know? Your loss is worse than theirs. Okay, so now we integrate with risk management. That's that. That's that's the only thing I say about that. Um, and um, that's the only thing I say because that's a huge can of worms, and it's an area that I know nothing about. Um, I'm I'm a geek. You know, I'm an engineer, so I try to stay away from all of this, that's that part. Um, I try to provide all the information to those people who can make those decisions, um, do the translation from this is this thing into this, and here's how it's going to manifest, and then, you know, go on my merry way and do my thing. Um, so, in conclusion, it's really the platform, I mean, I really think about this thing, the platform security proposals are really important. Understanding that platform and starting to treat the cloud like a platform the way you treat any other software development platform is really the key thing. Um, stop talking about cloud. Start thinking about it's AWS. We're targeting you know, this other thing. It's the specific platforms. Now you can actually start figuring out whether or not your applications are at risk. You can start quantifying that risk. And you can start making intelligent decisions and having better guidance for your developers. So stop the FUD, like get down in the dirt, figure out how it works. So thank you very much for coming. I'll be around if you have questions.